My name is Dr. Andrew Stemmer. I'm a neurologist and neurointerventional radiologist at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital, and I'm the director of the stroke program. I treat a range of cerebrovascular conditions, that is, problems with the blood vessels of the brain. I treat mostly strokes in patients who have either blockages of their blood vessels or people who have aneurysms or are prone to leaking of the blood vessels of the brain. The world of stroke and treatments for the blood vessels of the brain is changing very rapidly and there's many different treatments that are offered. And one of the great things about MedStar Georgetown University Hospital is from medical treatments to surgical treatments, surgery can be minimally invasive or open surgery. We offer radiation treatments. If I see a patient who's having an acute stroke, meaning a blood vessel in the brain is blocked, in the emergency room right now, the clock is ticking, time is brain. We have to act as quickly as we can to diagnose the problem and then to treat the problem. It's a different scenario if I'm seeing someone in clinic who is diagnosed with an aneurysm in their brain, and we talk about the various options for treatment, the risks, and the benefits. It's completely normal to be nervous when there's a problem going on, especially a problem with your brain. So I completely understand the gravity and how serious it is. Part of my job is to help explain what's going on and what the options are, what the risks and benefits, the pros and cons of each treatment are so that we can make the best decision for each patient. One of the best things about the Georgetown Stroke Program is our affiliation with the National Rehabilitation Hospital. The National Rehabilitation Hospital is one of the best neuro-rehabilitation hospitals in the country. We have active research, we have some of the best physiatrists, physical therapists, occupational speech therapists available. We have studies to enroll people in. We're constantly improving in this area and this is one of the major strengths of being at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. I also have to mention that I love the people that I work with. Uh, I think with most jobs, the people that I work with in neurology, neurosurgery, radiology, we all work together as one team, which is what makes the job as special as it is. There are different types of strokes. There are two main types of strokes. The first kind, the most common type, is called an ischemic stroke, which is where a blood vessel in the brain is blocked. When the blood vessel is blocked, the blood and oxygen can't get through that blood vessel and that part of the brain can die. The other type of stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke. That's where a blood vessel in the brain, as opposed to being blocked, it will spring a leak or rupture. That's a hemorrhagic stroke. That's about 15% of strokes. If you think you're having a stroke or someone around you is having a stroke, the best thing you can do is get them to the hospital right away. If it's a hemorrhagic type of stroke, you don't want to be giving someone an aspirin, which also works as a blood thinner. Even if it's an ischemic stroke, one of the common symptoms that people have are difficulty moving their face or difficulty coordinating their swallow, and you don't want them to choke on a medication either or have it go into the wrong tube and cause an infection. So, my recommendation would be, if you think you or a loved one is having a stroke, bring them to the hospital as soon as possible. There's a broad range of symptoms, from mild to severe to fatal. The symptoms of a stroke uh, can be anything depending on what part of the brain is affected. It can be things like face weakness, arm, leg, numbness or weakness. It can affect your speech. It can affect your vision. It can affect your mental status. But the key is getting to the emergency room as soon as possible. We have many treatments that are available, but the sooner you get there, the better it is. There are a few different causes of ischemic strokes. Essentially, an ischemic stroke is when a blood vessel in the brain is blocked. One of the common reasons is that a clot will come from somewhere else in the body to block the, the blood vessel in your brain. Those can commonly come from the heart if there's an irregular heart rhythm. It can come from the neck if there's plaque or um, atherosclerotic disease that builds up in the neck. Or it can happen in the brain itself if there's plaque in the brain. 
Other causes of strokes would be atherosclerotic disease that develops in the brain itself, in the blood vessels of the brain. And that would be because of things like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, obesity, and genetics plays a role as well. So an ischemic stroke is a, is a blood vessel in the brain that's blocked. There are two main ways to treat this in the first couple of hours. The first way is with an IV medication called TPA. This is a clot-busting medication that goes in through the vein and it goes in over one hour. If that's not successful in breaking up the clot, for some patients, what we can do is go in through a blood vessel in the hip area, bring a small tube called a catheter, it's about the size of a piece of spaghetti, and we bring it up while we take pictures into the brain and we can pull the clot out directly that way. So it's surgery, but it's minimally invasive surgery. There's no cutting, there's no sutures. It's all done through the inside. A hemorrhagic stroke is a bleeding in the brain. There are a couple of common reasons for this. One is high blood pressure. The second would be trauma. And then there are a variety of other causes of blood vessel problems. For example, an aneurysm in the brain or an arteriovenous malformation, various weaknesses in the walls of the blood vessels. We treat a stroke depending on what caused the stroke. So if it's someone with hypertension or high blood pressure, the most important thing is to lower the blood pressure. If it's someone that has an aneurysm, then we have to talk about ways to treat the aneurysm. Or if there's another blood vessel mal malformation, like an AVM, we have to talk about treating those as well. So we treat the source of the rupture. Our treatments are getting better and better. The technology is getting better. The techniques are getting better. So our ability to treat patients is constantly getting better. There were five articles in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015 showing the benefit to patients of pulling out these clots as soon as possible. It seems as though at least 50% of patients get clinical benefit from these procedures. An aneurysm is a weak spot in the wall of a blood vessel in the brain. It can cause many things, but the major risk of an aneurysm is if it bursts. Now nobody has a crystal ball to know exactly if or when it will burst, but we do look at things like the size, the location, the shape of an aneurysm to help guide us as to whether the aneurysm should be treated or can be watched closely. There are different ways to treat aneurysms. One way, the oldest way, is open brain surgery. This is where a neurosurgeon will make an incision and go in through the brain and what they'll do is they'll put a clip across the opening of an aneurysm. It's like a clothespin that blocks off the aneurysm and stays with that person for the rest of their life. More and more aneurysms are being treated with a minimally invasive approach, which is endovascular treatment. That's where we go in through a blood vessel in the hip area, with like a small plastic tube. It's about the size of a tip of a pen cap, but it's very long. And we go up through the body into the blood vessels of the brain where we can fill the aneurysm from the inside using coils or plugs to block off the aneurysm. It accomplishes the same thing as the surgery, but there's no cutting, there's no sutures, there's almost no blood loss at all. If an aneurysm ruptures, the classic symptoms are a sudden onset of the worst headache of your life. It's much different from people that have migraines or people that have other types of headaches. People that have suffered this know there is no doubt about it. It is the worst headache of their life and it starts immediately. An unruptured aneurysm typically does not have symptoms. They can cause symptoms if they push on other nerves or other areas of the brain, but for the most part they're discovered incidentally. absolutely it's possible to survive an aneurysm rupturing, although you'd rather treat it before it ruptures. An aneurysm is a weak spot in the wall of a blood vessel. 
Think of it like a bleb on the side of a tire. And like a bleb on the side of the tire, the risk of an aneurysm is that it can burst and can rupture and cause very dangerous bleeding in the brain. It is very dangerous, but our treatments are getting better, our technologies are getting better, and the techniques for treating them are getting better. So it doesn't have to be a dire prognosis, and there are many patients that survive and make complete neurologic recoveries. Treatments for aneurysms are very effective overall. Um, our technologies are, are getting better and better, and different aneurysms need to be treated in different ways. There are some aneurysms that are better treated by open surgery, but more and more we're able to treat aneurysms from the inside with a minimally invasive approach. It's very effective in blocking off the aneurysm and preventing rupture. It should also be noted that not all aneurysms need to be treated. Some, some aneurysms are very small, some are very stable, and in some aneurysms the risk of treating them outweighs the benefit. So every one of these is an individual discussion with each patient. One last caveat would be that if an aneurysm is ruptured, it's an emergency. Those have to be treated right away. In an elective setting, people, we can talk about the risks and the benefits, the pros and the cons of all of the different treatment options that are available. An arteriovenous malformation, or AVM, is an abnormal connection between the arteries and the veins in the brain. Usually, the artery and the veins are connected by a capillary, which slows down the blood flow. But occasionally, there's a direct connection between an artery, which has a high flow vessel, into a vein, which is not used to a high flow vessel, and you can get bleeding in that case. Arteriovenous malformations, or AVMs, are complex lesions that can cause bleeding, particularly in the younger population. They're challenging to treat, but there are many different treatment options that are available. One of them is open brain surgery, where a neurosurgeon will make an incision and resect it. One of them is treatment from the inside of the blood vessel, which is endovascular, where we go in through a blood vessel in the hip area go up into the blood vessel of the brain and block it off with different agents that act like a glue. We plug it up from the inside. And a third option is radiation. In practice, oftentimes we use a combination of these treatments. They work together, they work hand in hand. AVMs can present in many ways. About half of people with AVMs present with the bleeding in the brain, and that's usually a sudden onset of very severe headache. Sometimes they can present with seizures, and sometimes they can present with headaches as well. Endovascular procedures offer treatments to a variety of different conditions. An endovascular procedure is where we bring a, a catheter, which is a small plastic tube, no bigger than the tip of a pen cap, but it's like a long piece of spaghetti, and we bring it in through a blood vessel in the hip area, and watching under x-ray, we bring it up into the blood vessels of the brain and take pictures. If there's a blood vessel that's blocked, like in an acute stroke, we can pull that clot out. If there's a blood vessel that's leaking, like with an aneurysm or an AVM, we can block it up. There are other treatments as well. Sometimes people that have tumors that need to have the tumors taken out, we can treat them from the inside so we can block off the blood flow to the tumor before the resection and make it a safer surgery. Sometimes people with very severe nosebleeds that don't respond to just pressure, we can go through the inside of the blood vessel and block off those arteries to stop a nosebleed. There are other procedures. Sometimes people have strokes because they have plaque in their carotid arteries or they have narrowing of the arteries of their neck and we can go in with a balloon or a stent to open those blood vessels up to decrease the risk of stroke. Evidence suggests that people with migraines are more at risk for ischemic strokes. Now this depends on a number of factors. Women are more likely than men. Uh, women who smoke or who are on oral contraceptives are at a higher risk as well. Um, but the increased risk would be for ischemic strokes. My recommendation would be that for people who suffer migraines, if you have other symptoms besides a headache, 
such as weakness or numbness or vision problems to come to the hospital as soon as possible. That's a good question. Uh, people with migraines can have symptoms that mimic strokes, and people who have migraines are also at greater risk to have strokes, so this is a very difficult um, question to answer. Uh, it depends somewhat on the history. If someone's had these symptoms before with their migraines and you know that this is what happens, that might suggest that this is a migraine as opposed to a stroke. But sometimes it's really difficult to know. We have to depend on our neurologic exam, our brain imaging, and our clinical intuition to the best uh, extent that we can. One of the keys with stroke is that you only have a few hours to treat it. So if you think that it's something else, you might miss your opportunity to treat it. So typically, even if we're not sure, we will treat you as though it's a stroke until we can be sure that it's not. A TIA is a transient ischemic attack. It's essentially a mini stroke. It's the same thing as an ischemic stroke, but the symptoms go away before any permanent damage is done. So it's sort of like the world's best alarm clock because no permanent damage was done, but we have to treat it very seriously, just like a stroke, to prevent it from happening again when we might not be so lucky. It does. Um, as with many diseases in the brain, having a history of having it before puts you at higher risk for having it again. So a TIA does put you at increased risk for a stroke, and a TIA should be treated just like a stroke because the risk is higher in the first couple of hours and days afterwards. So it's important um, that we diagnose the cause of it and treat it immediately. Neurointerventional treatment is also called endovascular treatment, which means treatment from the inside of a blood vessel. There's no cutting, there's no suturing, there's no blood loss. It's putting a catheter, which is a small plastic tube, in an artery near the hip area, and we can use that tube to take it up through the blood vessels of the body and into the blood vessels of the neck and brain, if we have to, to take pictures and to treat diseases in a minimally invasive way. There is a range of neurointerventional procedures, but at the most basic level is a diagnostic cerebral angiogram. That's taking pictures of the blood vessels of the brain, and this can be done for many reasons, to diagnose a narrowing of a blood vessel, to diagnose an aneurysm, or an AVM. There are many reasons for a diagnostic angiogram. Diagnostic angiograms are typically done when a patient comes in in the morning and they'll leave in the afternoon. The procedure takes about one hour, and you're awake the entire time. I'll use numbing medicine in the hip area, but other than that, you will not feel anything. I'll talk you through the procedure, and the most important thing, like with any pictures, is to minimize the movement, so the more still the patient can stay, the better the pictures are. For other procedures where we have to treat aneurysms or go up into the brain itself, the patient will often be under general anesthesia where they will take a nap and then we'll go to work. Similarly, you won't feel anything. There are no nerve endings on the inside of the blood vessel, so you will not feel the catheter go up. When I take the pictures, I will let you know what you might feel with the contrast that we use to take the pictures. So you may feel during the actual pictures warmth on one side of the face or the other, bright lights behind one eye or the other. That's completely normal and goes away in about three seconds.